favorite characters. We all have them. It depends on where you are in your life when you watch a certain show, what the show is, and what's important to you. If you're a person who values loyalty to your friends above everything else, then you might like Hisame. If you like characters who are incredibly misunderstood and live in the shadows with an immense amount of power that's never fully fleshed out, then you probably love Itachi. If you have daddy issues and you're insufferable, then you probably love Sasuke. Different people like different characters. That's just the way it goes. But does this mean that there is a best character or simply just people's favorite characters? Is the character who's the most people's favorite the best? Or is the character with the most vehement and violent following the best? Well, this is where we kind of run into issues because obviously everything in art is subjective. So you could adore a character that I detested and therefore us coming to a conclusion of who the best character in Naruto is is almost impossible. However, I feel as though this is only an issue when you look at Naruto as a whole. See, when you look at an incredibly lengthy franchise like Naruto, with over 750 episodes, over a dozen movies, light novels, one-off manga runs, it's incredibly hard to look at that incredibly dense, complicated, and fleshed out universe and point at one character and say, yeah, that character is the best. Because that best character may not even be involved in some arcs. That best character may not show up until 300 episodes into the anime. I mean, the character who just won Naruto 99, Minato, Naruto's father, doesn't show up into the story until about halfway through. So to sit here and act like Minato is the greatest character in all of Naruto when he plays a very minor role in Naruto is kind of a lot to ask. But you could make the argument that the only reason that Minato won Naruto 99 in the first place is because we knew that whoever won was gonna get a story written about them. And Minato falls into the category of everybody loves him, but we know next to nothing about him. But there's other characters who play a large role throughout the entirety of Naruto who remained in the top three of popularity polls for the entirety of Naruto. Characters like Kakashi. But just because Kakashi was at least tangentially involved in every single arc in Naruto, does that make him the best character? I mean, immediately into the start of Shippuden, Kakashi pretty much all but disappears from the story for 50 or so episodes. As Yamato takes control of the new Team 7, and now Kakashi's just kind of hanging out in the village. And thus, I've come to the conclusion that the best way to talk about best character in Naruto isn't by talking about Naruto as a whole, but instead by breaking down Naruto into its arcs. See, OG Naruto has five arcs. Canon arcs. It has way more arcs if you're counting filler. And Shippuden has 12 canon arcs, which makes sense when you consider the fact that Shippuden's about double as long as OG Naruto. And I firmly believe that in every single one of these individual arcs, different individuals prove themselves to be the best character in Naruto. See, because here's the thing. Well, obviously a lot of talking is done about the fact that Naruto forgets its side cast of characters, mostly revolving around the fact that most of the Konoha 13 didn't get much in the way of character development. I would argue that there are very few repeats on this list of best characters from an arc to arc perspective. And while Naruto definitely does as a story, forget the Konoha 13, I believe that that's mostly because they were introducing a massive cavalcade of characters elsewhere. See, if Naruto was a story that focused entirely on Konoha and everything that happened solely within the walls of Konoha, then it would have been all but impossible to forget the Konoha 13. But since the story of Naruto is a sprawling worldwide story, unfortunately, much in a very similar capacity to My Hero Academia, because we're introducing all of these characters from outside of our immediate surroundings, some of the characters in our immediate surroundings are going to get forgotten. So, ironically, I believe that by breaking down Naruto on an arc-by-arc -arc basis, you you and I will have much more agreement about who the best characters from Naruto are than if we were to simply be like, okay, who's your favorite character from Naruto? Oh, that's cool. I hate him. Here's mine. See, because by taking a chunk of Naruto and looking at it objectively, you and I can probably find equal ground and agree on the fact that X character shined in that arc. And thus, you and I can agree on who the best characters in Naruto are. So get out your pens and get out your paper because we're going arc by arc all the way through Naruto to figure out who the best character in Naruto is. And at the end of this long 17 entry list, you and I are gonna see just how many characters we agree upon. So with no further ado, let's get into the best characters from every Naruto arc. Before we get into all that, guys, please, for me, 
like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like the idea of me breaking down some of your favorite anime arc by arc, go ahead and follow my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime. Or if you just like the idea of me breaking down anime, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Utaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you want to look like somebody who has complex breakdowns on anime, go ahead and head into my brand new merch shop, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime sweatshirts, t-shirts, and sticker packs known to man. So fortunately, with a video like this, finding a place to start is incredibly simple. So we're going to start this video off in the way that we tend to start these videos off at the beginning. But in the circumstance of today's video, that beginning is the first arc in all of Naruto, the prologue, also known as the Land of Waves. Now, unfortunately, as the Naruto hipster that I am, this is my favorite arc. So you could say that the entirety of Naruto went downhill from here, but some arcs definitely came close to the Land of Waves arc. I know, I'm the worst, but I believe that the direction of the Land of Waves arc was the best direction that Naruto ever headed in. The character development was interesting, the team dynamic was really cool. It has one of the best bad guys all throughout Naruto, Zabaza, one of the greatest and saddest endings to any arc in anime history, Zabaza and Haku's death. It tells a real life enriched and beautiful story, and then you pan out and you realize all that was accomplished is that they built a bridge. But Naruto's ability to make you care about a bridge being built is truly where the show shined. Now, if you've been watching my videos recently, you'll know that I've been doing a little bit of backpedaling. That is to say that I've been rather honest and open with my community and telling them that I may not hate Sasuke as much as you believe. For me, backpedaling this point always comes with the caveat that there are arcs where I really like Sasuke and there are arcs where I detest Sasuke. And the Land of Waves arc is unfortunately an arc where I really like Sasuke. See, Sasuke in the Land of Waves arc is an incredibly complex and cool character who's going through an actual visible character development arc. When we're first introduced to Sasuke, he's this brooding, dark, moody, emo little child who's only fixated on killing his brother. However, when you find out the motivations of why Sasuke wants to kill Itachi, that kind of makes sense. I mean, Sasuke was born to a happy family and a powerful clan, all of which was stolen from him by said brother. It makes you realize, slowly but surely, that the genius that Sasuke is, along with the attitude that he has, all play into the story of his youth. See, Sasuke was raised by an incredibly powerful clan under a genius older brother. And in order to play catch up with that older genius brother, he himself also had to become a genius. However, none of that meant anything when one day he came back to his clan and found them all massacred. And after that moment, Sasuke decided to commit his entire life to revenge. And while it's just kind of Sasuke's backstory until eventually he does kill Itachi and Shippuden, the reason that I like Sasuke in the Land of Waves arc is because you see Sasuke begin to realize that there's more important things than revenge. See, if you put yourself in the shoes of Sasuke in the Land of Waves arc, and really any time prior to him killing Itachi, every single time that he puts his life on the line, he's risking not getting his revenge. Now, obviously, Sasuke understands that he needs to get stronger to kill Itachi, and the only avenue to get stronger in Konoha is to become a Genin, and to join a Genin team, and become a Chunin, and so on and so forth. So there's always gonna be at least a little bit of risk involved. However, Sasuke makes a couple of key decisions throughout the Land of Waves arc that proves he's willing to put his life on the line for the people around him. See, Sasuke, in what was almost definitely a life or death battle against Haku, put his life on the line to protect Naruto. Somebody who he pretended he couldn't stand, but in actuality, he found himself getting closer to. And the reason that this closeness and this bond was being formed is because of the collaborative work that Naruto and Sasuke were doing in this battle against Sabaza and Haku. See, slowly but surely throughout the Land of Waves arc, Sasuke realized that Naruto and the rest of Team 7 were slowly becoming more important to him. And as these characters around him became more important to him, Sasuke began to realize that there's more to life than just trying to kill Itachi. And watching Sasuke have to juggle with the relatively daunting fact that if he puts his life on the line for these people who he's beginning to care about, he may not achieve the thing that's most important to him and still elect to put his life on the line, made him, in the early parts of Naruto, one of my favorite characters. However, after this arc, he obviously strays from that ideology entirely, and then singularly focuses on Itachi to basically get rid of all complexity he has as a character. Moving on! The next arc after the Land of Waves arc is the first real arc of Naruto. That is to say, the first non-prologue arc of Naruto. And that arc would be the Chunin Exams. While there are a lot of incredible characters that are introduced during the Chunin Exams, as this is pretty much our introduction to the rest of the Konoha 13 
13 in a meaningful capacity, while also being our first introduction to characters like the Sand Siblings. If I had to sit here and point at an individual character who shined the brightest in the tuning exams, it's a pretty easy answer, for me at least, and I hope for you. Because the best character from the tuning exams is Rock Lee. See, because not only is Rock Lee on Demon Time for the entirety of the tuning exams, as he decided to square up with arguably the two strongest Genin in all of Konoha at that moment, both Sasuke and Gara in the same arc, but he also had a legitimate chance at winning against both of these Genin. See, Rock Lee, before the tuning exams even really kicks off, decides to beef with Sasuke. He hears about Sasuke's genius and how he uses his Sharingan to be one of the strongest out there. And naturally, this intrigues somebody like Rock Lee, somebody who has no natural genius whatsoever. And therefore, Rock Lee wants to test what he's been able to build up with hard work against the genius of the Uchiha. And he does just that. Rock Lee, with just the power that he's built up and without using any of the gates or taking his weights off, manages to speed blitz Sasuke with his two Tomei Sharingan. In fact, Rock Lee is embarrassing Sasuke at such a level that Mike Guy's turtle summon has to step in to make sure that he doesn't kill him. All of this from a guy who doesn't use ninjutsu or taijutsu. And arguably this moment is actually one of the most important moments in Sasuke's character development. See, because Sasuke's living in this perpetual state of possible embarrassment at the idea that other people from the Konoha 13 might be stronger than him. Like I said, this moment it was the Konoha 12, but whatever. And while his key concern was people like Naruto, the fact that Rock Lee pulled up on the entirety of Team 7 and embarrassed Sasuke in front of them without the usage of ninjutsu or Gen Jutsu was absolutely a turning point in Sasuke's mentality that he may not be able to achieve the strength he wants to in Konoha, which is kind of asinine when you think about it, considering the fact that Rock Lee and Naruto were achieving their strength in Konoha. Like, oh no, did you just get beaten in a fight by Rock Lee? Go train with Rock Lee. But this isn't even the only person that Rock Lee embarrasses during the tuning exams. See, because Rock Lee gets a pretty tough hand in the tuning exams. Well, at least after the Forest of Death, during the first round of one-on-ones. See, because the first person that Rock Lee has to fight in one-on-ones is the strongest character in the arc, Gara. And so, in this fight of ultimate genius versus ultimate hard work, ultimate hard work should probably lose. However, it's in this fight that it's revealed what the through line of the entirety of Naruto is gonna be about. Hard work overcoming genius. And thus, Rock Lee versus Gara not only is one of, if not the greatest fight in the entirety of OG Naruto, but it also showed us the amount of grit, determination, and hard work Rock Lee was willing to put into it anything. Between the weight dropping scene being able to go fast enough to outblitz Gara's perfect sand defense and kicking Gara so hard that he dabs, Rock Lee once again proved in this arc that through just hard work, he would achieve everything he wanted. And that's not even talking about the Forest of Death, mind you. I mean, let's not forget who pulled up in the Forest of Death to save Team 7 after Sasuke got knocked out by Orochimaru. And sure, while Rock Lee didn't win in his battle against the Sound Ninja, he pulled up by himself to help people who he was technically competing against. Easy number one pick for the tuning exams, and if you disagree, honestly, you're insane. Let's get on to our next arc, because coming up next is probably a pick that you won't agree with, but I have my reasons. Because the arc after the tuning exams is the Konoha Crush arc. And while plenty of people would say that the best character from this arc is somebody like Gara or Naruto, or maybe even Mike Guy or Kakashi, I genuinely think, and this is gonna be probably an unpopular opinion, that the best character from this arc is Hiruzen. Oh, boo, yeah, yeah, all right, get it out. Oh, Nick, how could you say Hiruzen? One of the most hated characters in all of Naruto is the best character from an individual arc. Uh, uh probably because he is. At this point in time, Orochimaru was the big bad of Naruto, the final boss, if you will. This is long before we had to worry about the Akatsuki, Obito, Madara. At this point in time, Orochimaru was it. And he was currently trying to destroy the only village that we'd ever spent any amount of time in, Konoha. And you know who stepped up to 1v1 the biggest bad in all of Naruto? Hiruzen. Well, people like Mike Guy and Kakashi were battling against Sand Village Shinobi, and Naruto was off battling against Gara in the woods, and Sasuke was pinned to a tree. Hiruzen was battling objectively the most important battle in his 
late 70s. And yet, Hiruzen was battling against Orochimaru, Tobirama, and Hashirama simultaneously, using some of the most insane jutsus we'd ever seen, like roof tile shuriken. And while yes, obviously this battle ends with a 10 episode stalemate of Orochimaru trying to pull the sword of Kusanagi through Hiruzen's abdomen, the beginning part of this battle was really good. Seeing Hiruzen rip off his cloak and reveal his combat outfit, him summoning Monkey King Enma, turning Monkey King Enma into an adamantite staff, an adamantite staff that's able to use clone technique and turn himself into a cage to stop things like deep forest emergence from Hashirama. To top it all off, this battle ends with the first ever on-screen usage of Reaper Death Seal. And we get to see Hiruzen not only have enough power to seal away the souls of Tobirama and Hashirama, but also put legitimate fear into Orochimaru's soul. And while Hiruzen doesn't have enough chakra to seal away Orochimaru's soul, which by the way, if he wasn't split into two shadow clones, he probably would have had enough chakra, mind you. He did have enough chakra in his high 70s to be able to seal away Orochimaru's arms. And thus Hiruzen with his life was able to take away what Orochimaru valued more than anything, his arms, and therefore by extension, his jutsu. And listen, say what you will about Hiruzen, but Hiruzen doesn't become a bad character until Shippuden. Up until this point in time, I mean, obviously Hiruzen wasn't being incredibly attentive to Naruto, but it was all the flashbacks that we got in Shippuden that made us realize that Hiruzen might not have been the world's best dude. But up to this point in time, he was just the incredibly badass old Hokage who gave his life to make sure that Orochimaru would never be a threat to Konoha again. And for the pain and misery that he was able to inflict upon this iteration of Orochimaru, he gets best in the arc tag for me. But this next arc isn't gonna be nearly as controversial because our next arc is the search for Tsunade arc. And the best character from this arc is obvious, easy, and non-controversial because the best character from this arc is Naruto. Well, there are tons of moments up to this point where Naruto shines as an incredible character, like in his battle against Haku, his speech with Zabuza, his speech against Neji, his battle against Gara. I genuinely believe the search for Tsunade arc is where Naruto comes into form as a character. See, this arc is about Naruto showing and not telling. See, Naruto has to prove in this arc to Tsunade that he will be able to master the Rasengan. And while on premise that might seem like a relatively simple plot point that doesn't really mean all that much, what Naruto accomplishes by showing that Tsunade through an insane amount of hard work that anything can be accomplished is that the will of fire still exists in Konoha and that there's still children that need people like her to lead them. See, while it might seem like a relatively simple thing that Naruto was able to master the Rasengan in a couple of days, and that was enough to convince Tsunade to come back to Konoha and be Hokage, in actuality, what it showed Tsunade is that if she worked as hard as she could, she could bounce back from the mental ailments and the PTSD that have been affecting her for the last couple of decades. But there's more to what Naruto accomplishes than just the simple act of mastering the Rasengan in this arc. Naruto also goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Kabuto, an Ombu-level threat who's able to take down Tsunade. Tsunade. And while Kabuto isn't stronger than Tsunade at a certain point in time, she's just really dealing with her hemophobia and she isn't entirely over it yet, Naruto, by putting down one of the grittiest performances throughout the entirety of his own show, manages to overwhelm Kabuto. Whether it be blocking his punch with his headband, catching the kunai between his fingers, or hitting Kabuto with the first Rasengan that wasn't nailed into a tree, Naruto steps up in the biggest possible way in this arc, all to ensure that Tsunade comes back to Konoha. And to make sure, mind you, that Orochimaru doesn't get his arms back. So it feels pretty clear and obvious to me that Naruto is our winner. And listen, technically you could put Naruto as best character from any arc. I mean, the show is about him, but I'm trying to make this list as diverse as possible, which is why the best character from our next arc, which is the Sasuke retrieval arc, is Shikamaru. Now this is probably the toughest choice I've had to make in this entire list. Sasuke Retrieval Arc is multiple characters' best arcs. It's Neji's best arc, it's Choji's best arc, it's one of Sasuke and Naruto's best arcs, it's Tamari's best arc, it's definitely Shikamaru's best arc, it's Kiba's only arc. And while it's not Rock Lee's best arc, you better believe he was awesome in it. However, if I had to take one character from the entirety of the Sasuke retrieval arc and point at them and say, without that character, none of this would have been possible, 
I have to go with Shikamaru. See, in the wake of the tuning exams in the Konoha Crush arc, Shikamaru is the only person out of the Konoha 12 who was promoted to tuning, as his genius was put on full display in his battle against Tamaru. Therefore, in the wake of the Konoha Crush arc, with Sasuke running away from the village at probably the most opportune time, there were no tuning or Jonin to send after him. Therefore, Tsunade had to compile a team of entirely Genin, led by a child who was a Genin a week ago, Shikamaru. And without Shikamaru recruiting key characters from the Konoha 12 and identifying their strengths and setting up formations and plans that played to said strengths, not only would this ragtag group of Genin not have gotten a chance to get Sasuke back, they probably would have all died. See, Shikamaru understood that Kiba and Akamaru had the best noses out of the group, and therefore Kiba and Akamaru would lead the groups with their noses. And Kiba also understood that Neji had the Byakugan and was incredibly talented with it and could see in 360 degrees for hundreds of meters. And therefore, Neji would be the logical choice for rear support. But this isn't the only time that Shikamaru was able to capitalize on the strengths of the people that he brought with him on this mission in order to make sure they got the best possible result. When the entirety of the Sasuke Retrieval Squad was caught in Jirobo's Earth Prison Technique, upon Neji realizing that the chakra of the Earth Prison Technique wasn't equally distributed, Shikamaru was able to tell everybody to focus their attacks at a weak spot in the Earth Prison to break them all out. On top of this, Shikamaru was able to identify favorable matchups between himself or other members of the Sasuke Retrieval Arc against the Sound Village 4 Ninja that were waiting for them on the path to Sasuke. And while Shikamaru was technically going to lose his battle against Tuyuya, and he was saved by Tamari, he still put up a very good fight against one of the strongest Genjutsu users in the entirety of Naruto. There are only two or three people in the entirety of Naruto who use sound-based Genjutsu, and Tuyuya is one of them. Sound-based Genjutsu is wildly powerful. Mom and Pa were able to use it against the Paths of Pain. Not to mention, outside of the fact that she had sound-based Genjutsu, she was also able to control massive golems. And Shikamaru, like a week before this, lost to a woman with a fan, who actually showed up a little bit later and revealed that she could have killed Shikamaru pretty easily. Her weasel summon cut down the entire forest. It also killed Tuyuya. Naruto may not kill, the Sand siblings do. So while I could very comfortably give the best character in this arc to somebody like Rock Lee or Naruto for his incredible battle against Sasuke or Kimimaru for his incredible battle against Rock Lee and Gara and the reveal of Shikatsum Yaku and the Kaguya clan, I think Shikamaru rises above everybody else in terms of importance and in terms of character payout. See, because while Naruto's battle against Sasuke is incredible and Rock Lee's battle against Kimimaru is great, None of that happens without Shikamaru's coordination. So, while I understand if we find a little bit of disagreement on this arc, I'm gonna go with Shikamaru. And I'm now just realizing that I am the king of Yappersville. This is already an almost 25 minute video and there is 12 more arcs to go. And since we've only just now covered five arcs, that would mean that this video is very easily on pace to be one of our four videos over an hour on this page. But this is a fantastic stopping point. I mean, we just finished OG Naruto and I want my editor to survive to see the birth of his child. So we'll do Shippuden in another video. This is gonna be one of our very few two-parters, but don't worry. The second part will be coming out the next time that this page uploads, so you don't have long to wait. So how'd we do? Have I skewed your feelings and knowledge towards Naruto where you were able to guess what my top five be and then align your top five with me? Or have I had absolutely no influence over you whatsoever and you went 0 for 5? Tell me in the comments below. While you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Don't worry, if you went 0 for 5, there's 12 more coming in a couple of days. You got a second chance.